Welcome back, radio entrepreneurs, listeners, and fans. I'm producer Nathan Gobes, back here in the studio for another interview, filling in for Jeffrey Davis. I'm joined again by uh, one of our esteemed reporters, Tom McNulty of Lando and Anastasi. Welcome, Tom. Oh, it's always good to be here. Good to see you. Thanks. And uh, you have an interesting topic for us this morning. Uh, why don't you fill our listeners in? Well, I certainly hope so. Um, you know, I do intellectual property law and kind of the main factor of intellectual property law that most people think of is patents. Um, And when people think about getting patents, they think about things like, is it novel? You know, has it been done before? Is it obvious? You know, that sort of thing. Um, But over the last uh, several years, maybe the last 10 years, um, a different uh, different element of of patentability has kind of crept into the the public awareness. And that's uh, patent subject matter eligibility. Mm. So that's whether whatever it is that your invention is, is even the subject, the type of subject matter that that is uh, amenable to patent protection. Um, you know, patents are, patent law is kind of set forth statutorily and the statute on, um, on subject matter eligibility, uh, which is section 101, um, basically says that any new useful, new and useful process machine manufacture or composition of matter or any new and useful improvement thereof is basically subject matter on which you can get a patent. <laughs> Excuse me. So things like, um, literary works, musical compositions, things like that don't fall under one of those categories. So they wouldn't be um, subject for patent protection, They, you know, potentially protectable in copyright and trademark and different things like that, uh, but not under patent protection. Um, so th- this sort of everyone sort of went along for a while. The, the common elocution of this was basically anything under the sun is patentable. Um, you know, at, at least in the in the sort of technological fields, um, but there crept up a number of judicially created exceptions um, to patentable subject matter, uh, and the the prime goal behind this seemed to be um, to prevent monopolization over like fundamental basic tools of science and technology. Um, you know, the whole point of patent law is to uh, to have the science and technological fields advance and grow, and uh, mm-hmm. and you don't want to restrict that ability. Um, so the types of things that are generally considered not to be patentable subject matter are, uh, under these judicial exceptions, abstract ideas, um, anything that attempts to claim a law of nature or a product of nature, um, and anything that attempts to um, cover algorithms and or mathematical equations. Um, so basically, you know, try, trying to preclude monopolization of these kind of fundamental things. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Do you want to talk about, um, you know, in uh, opposite to those exceptions, maybe some of the things that uh, entrepreneurs are not considering as patentable? Because I think, you know, maybe a lot of people come into starting launching their business, whatever they're doing, and they're thinking, oh, I'm not building a widget. So therefore, it's not patentable, probably, but they're probably mistaken. (laughs) Um, Yeah, there's there's a number of things, Um, you know, like the laws of nature, if you isolated um, DNA, that DNA that you isolated would not be patentable because it's a natural product. But if you came up with a new way of isolating it, you know, that might be patentable. Um, if you came up with a artificially created DNA strand, that would be patentable. Um, so it's really um, often often there are kind of ways around these things by claiming methods rather than products or, or vice versa. So I understand there's um, some potential shift in uh, the the judicial standing on uh, these exceptions. Um, why don't you talk to us about that? Okay. Well, over the years, um, you know, these have been these have been used to try to you know, like I say, really kind of keep these building blocks clear. But it's been sort of creeping closer and closer to getting to things that normally would have been considered patentable. Um, there was uh, a process patent was uh, was found invalid for claiming an eligible subject matter, and this was a test had been developed to measure, <coughs> excuse me, um, the levels of metabolite in a patient's bloodstream. Uh, metabolite being kind of a byproduct of you give them the drug and the body breaks it down, and they they discovered that you could use the metabolite level to determine, you know, changes in dosage that might be needed. Um, they conceded that the actual way to test for the metabolite was all stuff that had been done before. Um, 
And the, the court uh, invalidated that because they found that given that all the other stuff in the claim had been done before, um, the test was effectively trying to claim um, the body's ability to break down this drug into metabolite, which is a law of nature. Mm. Um, so that was sort of invalidated uh, on that ground. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you get a lot of these sorts of uh, uh, discussions and issues in the in the computer field, the software field. Um, there was a claim for um, using a general purpose computer. So, you know, a standard run of the mill computer, programming it using an algorithm to convert binary coded decimal numbers into pure binary numbers. Um, this was found to be no more than abstract mathematics because it was taking a mathematical algorithm and just using a general purpose computer to then uh, accomplish what it had done. Um, and that's that sort of has become one of the themes in, in the software side is if you take something that has existed before, something that people have done before, and you simply automate it using a general purpose computer, uh, it will be found not to be patentable um, under, un, under 101. That generally makes sense. It sounds like, you know, it's, it's something that, uh, like you said, everybody's been already doing just because you, you make it run without having a, a human sitting there pressing keys uh, doesn't mean that you've really developed anything new. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these make sense in terms of whether the claims ultimately should be allowable, but the real question is whether it should be done under subject matter eligibility under some other, you know, anticipation or obviousness kind of test. Um, you know, there's a lot of these, a lot of these are, are basically looking at whether the, the non- law of nature, non-algorithm part has been done before, which feels much more like a, a you know, anticipation or obviousness type of analysis. Um, but the, I mean, the advantageous uh, part of this for accused infringers is these are often being decided at the outset of a litigation. So somebody will file a patent infringement complaint and the defendant, rather than answering the complaint, will move to dismiss on the grounds that the patent subject matter is not eligible. And they get out of it, you know, very early and considerably cheaper than going through a full-blown litigation, you know, but at the same time, there's a lot of factual analyses that go into whether something has preexisted, you know, whether it's been done before that, um, you know, basically gets done not by a jury, but by a judge and with no real factual basis or no real, no real record to base um, these decisions on. Interesting. So if, uh, if a business owner or entrepreneur out there gets a copyright infringement claim on them, maybe well, this pa is patent infringement. Excuse yeah. me, pat excuse me. Patent, <laughs> you're right. Totally different. Uh, patent <laughs> infringement claim. Uh, perhaps this is something they should be taking a look at or contacting you guys to, uh, to consider. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, the, the one case that sort of brought this to my, I guess, immediate attention uh, came out uh, last year, this company called American Axle. Um, they designed a truck axle that has um, vibration dampening sleeves, uh, which apparently can be, you know, they're very cheap, could be cardboard, could be something like that. Hmm. Excuse me, but the, uh, the claims that they were trying to get were methods of making these, these axles. And apparently the, the real improvement is there's two different types of vibration that they um, that they're trying to dampen that they say that their invention does dampen. Um, and that's considered to be an improvement over prior art axles that could dampen one or the other, but not both of these modes. Um, but the problem is the vibration dampening is based on what's called Hooke's law, which, um, you know, generally, very generally speaking is, is uh, a law that relates to the, the tension on a spring versus the stretch on a spring. Um, so it relates to, you know, it relates to dampening. And the way they had claimed this, it was basically they identified some of the components and then the method included a step of tuning them to reduce the vibrations. And the specification made reference to this Hooke's law, excuse me. And the district court found in the federal circuit agreed that what they were effectively doing was taking a standard, um, you know, conventional axle and standard axle components and trying to uh, basically uh, monopolize Hooke's law uh, with respect to these axles and that they didn't really put in, you know, in the claims, for example, how you tune it or, or you know, whether there's some specific, you know, thickness or dimensionality that, that would mm. result in, in these things. They just basically used Hooke's law to do so. Mm. Um, this went to on bank review at the federal circuit and the federal circuit is the, the single circuit court that handles patent law. So 
they're effectively, you know, setting the nationwide standard for this sort of thing. Um, and the en banc court um, basically kind of came to a 6-6 split, uh, which effectively means that the initial federal circuit opinion stands. Um, and this was very surprising because this is, you know, it's a clear, tangible thing that's being uh, that's being described and and perhaps not claimed. It's a method of making the axle, but you know, effectively, that's what's being claimed. And um, and people were very surprised that something this sort of tangible and concrete uh, might somehow be found not to be eligible. You know, like I say, the statute itself identifies uh, improvements on on uh, you know machines, manufacturers, processes. Um, you know, this would certainly seem to qualify statutorily. But, yeah, uh, I would agree. But um, here but, we are. Uh, yeah, but not, so, neither neither of us are on the courts. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So the Supreme Court is currently uh, there's a petition for uh, cert at the Supreme Court, and they are deciding whether to take it or not. They have a whole bunch of amicus briefs, um, and and they've asked for the Solicitor General of the United States to chime in, which is usually a sign that they're going to take it. Um, and if they did, that would likely be this this term. So. It's interesting. an interesting one to sort of follow and see where it goes. So uh, it, whether they take it on or maybe whether they don't, but uh, w- you know, if you want to maybe summarize what your opinions on what the implications could be for entrepreneurs uh, down the road, with, depending, um, obviously it depends on how they they side, <laughs> and maybe we do a follow up uh, after that. But you know, if do you have any thoughts on it now? Yeah, I think in this case, um, you know, these are sort of outlining. There's there's ways you should look at writing your claims um, when you're filing a patent application. Um, You know, if you put more specificity into, you know, exactly what physically, mechanically would result in these things, these claims would likely have been um, allowable. And, And quite frankly, if you had put in the specific physical structures and never mentioned Hooke's Law, uh, you know, my opinion, the examiner probably would not have come up with it on his own, or the courts rather probably wouldn't have come up with it on their own. It wasn't issued patent. Um, you know, so I think I think it's it's going to be in part a way of making sure that you've worded things appropriately, and in part it's going to be you know really discussing upfront because patent applications are not cheap, and litigation is not by a, by a significant factor more not cheap. Um, so it's something that people are really going to have to take a look at. Um, really look at claiming from a variety of different angles and and really consider what you're getting into in light of the sort of shifting framework. Um, you know, if you got a patent 10 years ago, the the standards that were applied are not the same as today. And perhaps, you know, perhaps the the validity and the eligibility are, are going to be looked at under a different light and in a less favorable light. Mm, that makes sense. That makes sense. So obviously the uh as you said, uh, you know, the specificity and, and how it's put together is, is highly important. So it's, uh, it's definitely good that uh, if people are interested that they reach out to somebody like yourself or, or any of your, uh, your fellow attorneys and partners at Lando and Anastasi. Tom, how can people reach you if they want to, uh, to get in touch? Uh, well, they can get me at T McNulty, T-M-C-N-U-L-T-Y at LALaw.com. Um, and you can find our website at www.lalaw.com. Great. And of course, you can find Tom all over the Radio Entrepreneur's website. He's a regular on our show. Uh, we're also on LinkedIn, Facebook, iTunes, YouTube. We're all over the place, too. So uh, <laughs> search Radio Entrepreneur's and you'll you'll find us and, and you'll find Tom there, too. Tom, I want to thank you again for joining our show. Uh, we're always happy to have you and uh, give us updates like these. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thanks. We'll be back with more segments on Radio Entrepreneurs.